Although we often think of the Industrial Revolution as, of course, starting in, um, in earnest in the early 19th century, it's really from the second half of the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century that we see the massification of production, the creation of large-scale enterprises capturing enormous economies of scale and scope with the continuous throughput production process being refined in a quite scientific fashion from the late 19th century and into the first decades of the 20th century. And we see some people like Frederick Taylor, for example, are very strong advocates of a scientific approach to the control of production, focused on standardized parts and smooth supply chains, and as much as possible in a rather pessimistic view of particularly Taylor's scientific uh, management, scientific approach, so-called scientific approach to production, minimizing the scope for human beings to mess it up. So very often uh, Taylorism is seen as in some sense turning people into quasi-machines on the production line. Taylor himself had a rather pessimistic view of workers. He thought that they would slacken off at every opportunity. So insofar as the operators of machines on a production line were to some degree disciplined by the automated process of production, forcing them to keep up with the machines, he thought that was a good thing. Of course, there were many quality problems associated with that. And we saw subsequent uh, attempts to try and overcome problems in manufacturing where employees would either go on strike uh, and completely bring uh, production lines to a stop or just simply would not be a force for continuous innovation in the Japanese sense, Kaizen. Uh, one researcher who subsequently had enormous influence on thinking about the organization of work was someone called Elton Mayo, like mayonnaise, Mayo, Elton Mayo. Um, he went and studied a, a manufacturing plant um, Looking at uh, the sources of productivity improvement and quality improvement and an interesting effect of him observing the manufacturing was that quality actually improved while he was there uh, doing his study. When he looked more carefully into it, what he found was that actually what was happening was that the middle managers who were managing the factory workers were actually being nicer to the staff because he was there. And one of his takeaway lessons in the end was actually if you treat your employees pretty well, rather than causing machines and threaten them, for example, especially if they threaten to go on strike because of poor conditions, then the factory workers can take a certain pleasure in their work and they can contribute to improving productive processes. And so we saw that these ideas became very much in encapsulated in early 20th century, mid 20th century um, production reforms in the United States and then those ideas were imported into Japan. People like Deming, for example, very much focused on uh, recognizing quality production and innovation, gave his name to the Deming Award here in Japan, which is a, a, a very honorable achievement for any Japanese company in manufacturing processes. So we see that Japan probably more than anywhere at a certain period in the 60s and 70s and the 1980s, were able to create a very healthy culture, a workplace culture on the gemba, on the factory floor, and effectively have people working positively to try and improve the quality of the manufacturing process, to try and get rid of muda, no waste, and so this has been a key driver of Japan's post-war manufacturing success, that ability to produce reliable, high-quality goods in a timely fashion and uh, with effectively decreasing uh, marginal costs over time. So effectively allowing that competitive dynamic uh, we've talked about earlier of price down, cost down. But uh, before we talk further about these issues of Japan's competitiveness, we need to go back a little bit though and remind ourselves that one of the drivers indeed for the massification of manufacturing is actually a sadder truth about the late 19th century and the first half of the 20th century. Increasing great power rivalry, the rivalry between nation states, which then led to the tragedy of World War I and then World War II, saw the rise of mass armies organized on modern organizational principles being served by mass manufacturing. 
that actually significant impetus to the professionalization of manufacturing comes about through wartime economies. And that's a uh, often neglected aspect when we talk about the rise of industrial efficiency, the large scale enterprise. We take it for granted these days with modern high quality uh, production produces so many goods of outstanding quality at a relatively uh, low price that a lot of the know-how in terms of basic manufacturing processes, in terms of organizing labor in supply chain management and whatnot, were either developed in response to uh, military orders or sometimes had their initial developments, particularly organizational terms, within the military themselves. After World War II, of course, many people who had served in the military then went to work for the private sector, and this is particularly in the, uh, the United States, uh, Britain, Germany to some degree. So unsurprisingly, they brought a mindset about organizational structures, uh, logistics and supply and so many other aspects of that experience, particularly as young men in uh, military service, they brought that then into corporate organization and the organization of production. Of course, one other element that's often forgotten is the in incredibly important role of, that women played in some wartime economies. This was actually particularly true in the United States and in the UK, uh, France in, in World War I, for example, to some degree in Japan as well. So that actually some of the norms of production and or you know, the organizing of manufacturing and whatnot uh, spread throughout society as a whole because of, of those wartime experiences. It certainly in a Japanese context made many people more inclined to reconcile themselves to the logic of industrial life, the trade-offs, for example, in terms of environmental impacts from mass production with pollution, for example, uh, and on the other hand, positive economic growth that led to Japan's uh, rapid prosperity, return to prosperity, uh, and into the 1960s, the income doubling period, for example, in the 1970s and the 1980s. Subsequently, we do see that uh, other societies, other economies that once were written off as, as having passed their heyday in terms of, say, manufacturing, and particularly the United States in the 1980s, it looks like it very much lost out to Japan. We do see a significant revitalization of American manufacturing uh, because many of the lessons that uh, Japan had developed effectively, starting with lessons from uh, American production uh, management, Japan had imported those, uh, refined them, made them work so well for Japan. America was able to re-import many of those lessons. A final thing, of course, is the increasing decoupling of place and production know-how. That uh, more and more companies, not just in Japan and the United States, but uh, companies from many, many countries, have been able to move their production sites to the lowest cost location. So we see, of course, the emergence of China from the late 1980s into the 1990s in many ways as the, uh, the factory of the world. And so companies increasingly that once had a strong manufacturing base at home are now predominantly knowledge-based enterprises that have very strong knowledge of how to actually manufacture production uh, wherever it happens to be uh, located in the world. An underlying uh, reason for this ability to shift production from one place to another is of course ever more reliable, reliable transport and communications technology, particularly the information uh, technology, the IT revolution of being able to have real-time data sharing has meant that it's been much easier to coordinate production across quite distant locations. And so the vast majority of goods that we would buy, say, in Japan today, invariably have many components that have, have crossed borders and sometimes multiple borders to come together for final assembly in a third place very often, such as China, and then come to the market here. So we see in general 
this coming together of massification, standardization, the pursuit of quality, the use of IT and new technologies such as you know, laser scanning and, and other technologies to make sure that there is no waste, there is no muda, uh, that uh, that uh, poor products don't get through and into the, through the production and distribution process into the hands of customers, that all of these technologies have come together to actually dramatically bring down the price of manufactured goods uh, to a point now we always expect uh, pretty much at any price point uh, a product to meet basic functional and quality standards that in the past may have been associated with premium products. One only needs to go into Unicodo for example and see how cheaply uh, but how, how well made so many things can be. This has a lot of implications for the sustainable competitive advantage of societies. It does mean, for example, that when we take this, these operational capabilities, these production and distributional capabilities for granted, the competitive advantages, uh, competitive, the competitive advantages of companies increasingly come down to their ability to meet new needs that customers have in really creative ways. So deep customer insight and very effective creativity applied design to meet customer needs. So in short, we have in a sense become quite spoiled by the astonishing developments in human capability to streamline, standardize, organize production and distribution uh, across the planet, quite literally.